Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Rick Hofer, and I am the uh, director of Speak. We are so glad you're here. It's an amazing thing. This is our first annual Speak Symposium, and we are jazzed. We have over 230 people, and they are joining. They are registering even as we speak. And so, um, but we're going to go ahead and honor those of you who are here already, and we'll uh, get started with a little bit of uh, the opening here. Again, welcome. Thank you for coming. This has been uh, a labor of, of uh, love to get this symposium going, and I'm so excited about the people who are going to be presenting to you. Each presenter will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes, followed by... Uh, well, each speaker, first one, then the next, and then we'll have discussion and questions and answers after both speakers have gone. We also want to acknowledge the land on which the School of Social Work buildings stand on. It's unceded and stolen territory from the native peoples in this area. We also want to acknowledge the grave harm brought, to col brought by colonialism to this land, especially the systematic attempts to erase indigenous and African-American identities through slavery and racist segregation laws. Many of the buildings in the, air, the town of Arlington uh, and the history of it was built upon uh, the work of enslaved people. And we definitely want to acknowledge uh, where we stand and, and what brought us here. So with that, I think it is time for me to uh, begin. All right. Uh, my, my talk uh, this morning uh, is about civic volunteerism and speak. And we'll talk about speak to begin with. But there's, there's other things that we um, want to acknowledge. And that is that speak uh, was created through the generous gift from the Simmons Sisters Fund at Texas Women's Foundation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a couple of minutes. So what is SPEAK and, and what, what, why is it? Well, SPEAK's mission is to amplify the voice of social work and policymaking. Uh, many of us teach courses on policy or have been in courses on policy. And we know that sometimes it takes a historical bent. And that's important. We have to know where we come from. But also, a part of the social work mission as a profession is to create change. And to be able to do that, we need to amplify our voices. Unfortunately, our students don't always know how to do that. And in fact, some faculty, of course, don't know how to do that. So the main mission of SPEAK is to amplify social work voice in the many ways that we can. So let me give you a short history of SPEAK. And it's, it's going to be very short because we've only been in existence since February of this year. Uh, the gift was received. Um, it, it's kind of an interesting story to me anyway. The, uh, we had conversations with a former student of mine named Serena Connolly Simmons. Uh, Serena Simmons Connolly, and uh, she um, had inherited a, a great deal of money from her, her father, uh, and she and her sister wanted to do good work with this. And she suggested the idea of kind of a policy center at UTA. And I was thrilled to go forward with this idea. Um, unfortunately, what we didn't know was that Serena was very ill and she passed away before this uh, transaction or this gift could be made. So uh, since then, I've felt a, a real duty, not just to, uh, to you know, the ideas behind Speak, but also to Serena as a person who was beloved and able to make a lot of things happen because of her goals and her um, social justice. She was called a social justice warrior in the Dallas area. And we lost a true friend of social work when she passed away. Since then, we have been doing quite a number of things. 
And these are just a few of our accomplishments in the short time we've been. We worked with voting and social work and to uh, create the Why Vote campaign. And we were using this as a help preserve democracy. Um, this, this campaign, all of these documents is a toolkit that can be downloaded and um, it's, it's free and it's an amazing job um, that, that uh, we've done and obviously the voting is social work. Uh, Mimi Abramovitz is on and Terry Mizrahi will be uh, in later on. They're leading this. The person who designed the graphics is uh, Ariel Beisel, who is uh, one of the speak staff people. So that's one big thing that we've done. Another thing that, uh, another aspect is, um, we've, we've hosted two students for their field placements and we actually paid them a stipend. That's an amazing thing for the students. And we're hiring students as research assistants, several of whom are on this call. And um, so we, one of the important things about civic engagement is that you have to have resources to do that. And so we're providing resources. In addition, we've become deputy voting registrars. That's uh, me on the left, the, uh, <laughs> and Ariel Beisel and Jessica Leach. We are at the uh, Denton County Elections Office, becoming certified volunteer deputy registrar. And we have others on, uh, other students and faculty who have done the same thing. But now I think the most important thing that we're doing is this particular conference. And we're so glad you're here. Uh, we have over a dozen of the top academics and practitioners and deep thinkers who are gonna be presenting today and tomorrow. We have over 320 registrants. And I think right now we probably have close to 70 people watching. So uh, it's, it's thrilling to see this all come together. And it's thanks to uh, the, the presenters and the staff. And we're looking forward to, to your comments as well. All right, so uh, what's the big idea behind SPEAK? Well, we know, and this is gonna be a theme throughout this conference, we know that democracy requires participation in self-governance by the largest numbers of, of the population possible. Now, some people don't believe this, but this, this thought is a social work core tenet. And we are called upon as social workers to, to ensure self-governance and widespread participation in the making of policy. It seems like this is uh, quite in danger now in several places. Texas has, uh, for example, passed one of the most restrictive voting laws uh, in the country. And we need social work's voice and values to, um, to overcome what's going on. Of course, this is called civic engagement and probably everyone in the audience knows it. But SPEAK is designed to increase the levels of civic engagement among social workers and their allies. We call it amplifying the voice of social work. So that's our big idea. That's our raison d'etre. Now, many of you will know what this uh, chart is. It's the civic volunteerism model. And it posits that social action is the result of having access to other things. And these other things include resources, such as money, time, and skills, psychological engagement, which stems from knowledge, practice, and a sense of self-efficacy, and networks, that is people who bring other people into the political system and help them get engaged to begin with. So all of these things are important. And some of the uh, folks on this at this conference presenting have done really good work on these uh, on this model and show how it works in social work or among social workers. But most of this research has been done kind of just saying cross-sectionally, do these variables hold? And uh, I think of that as kind of a static way of, of looking at it. So I'm approaching SPEAK in the whole civic engagement model here in this way. 
what if you use the model as an intervention plan rather than just a description of the world as it is? So that's what we think speak is. We think speak is a set of actions to increase civic engagement. It's an intervention, just like we might have an intervention in many other areas of social work. This is a, a, an intervention to increase civic engagement and the voice of, of um, social work. So how do we do this? We have funding for students. We have funding for programs like this. Uh, we create jobs for students. Um, both as research assistants and um, as, as their practicum, which again, we actually pay them for, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, we also have resources to help our students, our research assistants, work with other organizations. And that's how we got connected with voting and social work. We've worked with um, uh, influencing state policy. We've had connections with NASW at both the national and the state level. So having the, 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 the these are recruitment and engagement strategies. We're having events like this, we're holding trainings and we're providing access to trainings for students at UTA. So uh, these are some of the things that we consider are part of our intervention strategy. Now, this is the big question. Uh, how, how does it work? Do we know if it works? What do we know so far and how do we know? Well, I, I have to say we've only been in existence since February. So we don't know for sure if it works, but we do have some ideas about how well the uh, intervention, uh, the civic engagement model describes the folks at UTA who took it, who took a survey. So uh, obviously you have to have some variables if you're going to um, do a survey and then do some analysis. And, and so we've got political action, that's our dependent variable. We have uh, 12 political actions that we ask if the uh, respondents did or not. Um, in, in the end, because voting was so almost uh, universal, there was no variation. So I, I, I created a variable that had only 10 of these, but these are the things that you would typically expect. Uh, voting, using social media, following legislation, contacting officials at the federal and local levels, participating in rallies and protests, giving testimony, volunteering for a campaign and running for office oneself. So we have, we have all the, the information on how uh, the respondents did these things. And it varied a lot, uh, as, as other people have found, more difficult things are not done that often. Voting is almost universal. Uh, people use social media a lot. And then the rest of the things drop off pretty fast. Um, I was anticipating there would be more participation in rallies and protests in the last year, but it doesn't seem that that's increased that much. Anyway, that's our dependent variable that we're trying to impact. And then of course, resources was another set of the variables. Um, so we ask about household income. We ask when people uh, said that they rarely or never did a certain activity, we ask them if a lack of time was one of the, the issues behind that. And another thing that we asked was, well, maybe you don't know where to start. Is that true in your case? So these are all variables. Uh, we'll, I'll get to the results in a little bit. And then uh, this turns out to be incredibly important is the engagement and the sense of self-efficacy. And these are some of the questions. We have a composite variable where people answered, I consider myself to be well qualified to participate in politics. I feel I could do as good a job in public office as other people. I feel adequately prepared to effectively engage in politics. So those are all on the positive side, but there's also a negative sense of, of efficacy. Like government's so complicated, a person like me can't understand what's going on, or people like me don't have much say. And I don't think public officials care much about what people like I think. So, so those are two different variables. 
Let's see how they, oh, and then of course there's networks and connections. And so we ask about family background and whether a person was active in non-political or political organizations. So what are the results? Well, I have to start off by saying uh, the results are incomplete and we're still analyzing the data. So, so take all of these results with a little bit of, of, a, of, of a grain of salt. They haven't been peer reviewed or anything like that, but this is the initial data result. So it's important to believe in yourself. A positive self-efficacy is the most important variable I've come across uh, for more involvement. So people who think that what they do can work are much more likely to try. So that's, that's the first takeaway. The second takeaway is that the felt, the felt lack of time is a powerful deterrent to participation by students. Um, it got to be just a little bit depressing reading about how students feel overwhelmed with a family uh, and, and job responsibilities and all the other things going on in their life. And especially during the pandemic, when all of these things fell so hard on so many people, um, this, this is a, an important thing to, to remember. We, we can think about it intellectually, but the, the emotion behind the lack of time is uh, very, very disheartening for people. And then we also had the, the negative self-efficacy. It leads to less involvement, but the strength of this variable is not as in, uh, strong as a positive self-efficacy. So if we can get people to stop believing that they can't do anything and get them to believe that they can, then they will become more involved. And finally, of course, household income level is important. Um, income having cash uh, smooths a lot of barriers away. All right, so what are the implications for this uh, uh, so far that we could find? Well, first, time is for students the largest barrier. So what, what can we do about that? How do they get more time? And at the individual level, uh, perhaps, more skills in time management would be helpful. And so we have trainings for students that are free to them on how to, you know, some good, a very good uh, course on time management. However, we know that the problem is not really just at the individual level. We might be able to help in, in that way, but Scholarships, research jobs, paid internships, these kind of things are important to provide so that um, they, they can work less while they're students. Um, so many students are working full or nearly full time and then trying to, to get their um, schooling in. And it's, it's very easy for our ideas that they should be active in politics on top of everything else to get lost and really just um, seem impossible. And in the end, what we really need are structural solutions such as uh, free college or um, to keep the rising tuition down and other costs associated. So the, the implication of this variable of time, it, it, it goes everywhere from the individual answer to like reshaping higher education. Now, in terms of uh, efficacy, self-efficacy, we know that students who think they are good enough do more political actions. So the implication here that results is we need to help them feel capable. and We need to provide trainings that are actually uh, possible for them to, um, to get that sense of self-efficacy. And then the last implication is I think we need to expand the civic volunteerism model. Certainly we need to look at the variables of gender and race and ethnicity, uh, which I haven't uh, analyzed yet. So that's uh, on, the, uh, 
on the drawing board for the next kind of uh, analysis in the next presentation. So if you see me presenting on this topic again, it will be with uh, even more updated information and a larger data set. So with that, it, uh, it seems time that I, it, uh, I'm done. And so thank you very much for your attention. I am going to now introduce the second person on the um, panel, Shannon Lane, Dr. Shannon Lane. I'm so happy that you're here, Shannon. And we've met several times at conferences, but never had a chance to really sit down and talk. So I think this may be the first time. Dr. Shannon Lane is an associate professor at the Wurzweiler School of Social Work at Yeshiva University. Since 2004, she's been affiliated with the Nancy Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work. She coordinates the Campaign School for Social Workers, a two-day training that has trained more than 1,200 social work students and professionals from around the country to run for political office and hold leadership positions in political settings. Now, Shannon, I don't know that you know this, but I'm actually one of those 1,200 people. So many years ago, I, I took it um, when um, Nancy Humphreys was still alive. And uh, that was quite, quite a thing. So congratulations for keeping that going. Dr. Lane has earned her PhD in social work from the University of Connecticut and has taught social work policy, macro practice, and research at four universities. She shares her passion for political action by researching strategies to increase the political involvement of social workers and underserved populations. So, so Shannon, with that, uh, let me turn it over to you. I'm eager to hear what you're um, going to tell us. Wonderful. Thank you for that, that introduction. Um, it does seem weird because we, I, you know, I, I, you've read lots of my articles and we've had lots of sort of those kinds of conversations, but, but not in person. Um, and I do need to tell you all that um, because of the hard work of Tanya Roach Smith at the Political Institute over the last couple of years, we are now up to 2,300 social workers that have been trained through the campaign school, including, I see in the chat, a number of people who are, who are here today. So, um, so, and actually that's part of why, where I wanted to start our conversation today is to talk a little bit about, um, you know, in this, um, in this uh, country in which we are all dealing with theoretically the same political system, but in very different uh, political context. Um, we do have some good idea from doing the campaign school in a number of different places. Uh, what's, what are some of the important differences? And I wanted to, before I get started, just to um, make sure that I acknowledge some of the really amazing collaborators that I've had the chance to work with. Um, so the, um, the research that we did on the campaign school that I'm going to talk about today was a collaboration uh, with Jennifer McClendon, Jason Ostrander, and Tanya Rhodes-Smith at UConn. Um, and I also just wanted to highlight the, you know, there's a lot of really amazing work out there around political justice and political social work and political advocacy. Um, and as Rick said, acknowledged the late Dr. Nancy Humphreys, who made quite a bit of this work possible. Um, and also there's some really phenomenal people around the country, Justin Hodge at the University of Mis Michigan, Charles Lewis at CRISP, um, Ali Lozano and Suzanne Pritzker from the University of Houston. Um, Suzanne Marmo has been um, innovating a new field of uh, political social work within palliative care at Sacred Heart University um, and Gina McClendon at, at WashU are just a few of the people um, who allow this work to happen. Um, and a special shout out to everybody at the Humphreys Institute who work tirelessly year round, not just in a federal election year, but all the time to, to make sure we're talking about these things. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit, um, and I knew that Rick was going to talk about theory. I didn't know that he was going to talk about the same theory that I want to tell you about. So this should be a nice, this is, it's going to be as if we planned it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about sort of where I'm coming from in terms of political social work and how I think, um, I agree with Rick that this, the civic volunteerism model has, is a good start, but not the end to the discussion. Um, and then I really wanted to spend some time talking about the 
um, the ways in which the context that we do our work um, matters for social work advocacy and political social work. Um, so one of the ways that I feel qualified to answer this question is I've had the opportunity to do to work in the political world in all sorts of different places around the country. Um, so I spent a lot about 10 years in Washington, D.C., um, but I'm also from South Dakota. So I spent my formative years in one of the most conservative cities in South Dakota. Um, and um, and then after living in Michigan and getting my MSW there, um, came to the Northeast, um, where I've had the chance to do this work in Connecticut and New York over, I don't want to do that math, let's just say the last many, many years. Um, and I think that one of the advantages to that is having lived and worked in all these different places, it gave me, um, I think, uh, what I hope will be a good perspective on how the work looks different, uh, depending on where you're doing it. Um, and the work that I do around political social work is focused on the policy process. So how do we get social workers to be more involved in voting campaigns and policymakers? Um, how do we look at policy outcomes? Um, and I think, you know, like Rick, I have concerns about the CVM and how it doesn't look at, at things like gender and race, um, because that's how, where I've spent a lot of my policy work. But I also think it's really important, whatever we do, to think about how we can change social work education to make sure that we're giving our students and we're giving each other the best opportunities to succeed in, um, in our political work. Um, and Rick mentioned my uh, collaboration with the Humphreys Institute. So for those of you who, I hope there's not very many of you who aren't familiar with the Humphreys Institute, um, it's at the University of Connecticut. It was founded by the late Dr. Nancy Humphreys. Um, I'm Dr. Nancy A. Humphreys. She would be horrified if I said her name without the A. Um, and uh, the goal of the Institute is to increase the, the political participation and power of all social workers and the communities that we serve with the hope that that gives us an end goal of policy that reflects our professional values and social justice. Um, and the collaborators I mentioned early on, many of them are, are in these photos here. Um, so within the Humphreys Institute, and I suppose to use the, the language Rick used, really thinking about the interventions that the Humphreys Institute does, it includes the Campaign School for Social Work, uh, collaboration and leadership with voting as social work, um, and then also trying to conduct research around everything that we're doing to figure out what are the effective tools, what can other people learn from, and how can we make sure we're doing this work uh, the best we possibly can. Uh, this picture is from one of our last campaign schools pre-COVID. So if it makes you a little bit nervous to see so many people so close to one another, I want to assure you that this was, uh, you know, this was February of 2020. I don't know, maybe that in retrospect, that doesn't make you feel better. But this was this was right before everything shut down. Um, so if you are not familiar with the term political social work, um, this is a definition that Suzanne Pritzker and I have been working on for a, a, a while, um, which is that political social work is a way in which we can influence policymaking and politics to create social change. Uh, we believe really strongly that this is grounded in core social work values and ethics. And part of what I want to emphasize today is this just isn't just about individual activities, but really around challenging systemic discrimination and the institutional inequalities that result in some of this, the, the challenges that we see in our political world. Um, and I think that we can look at this both as individual actions that we can take as individuals, but we also need to look at ways in which the systems that we're operating are advantaging some of us and disadvantaging some of us. Um, you know, so for me as a white woman, uh, there, who with a lot of education, you know, there are doors that I can enter that other people can't. And so thinking about as social workers, how do we take advantage of those accesses and those privileges that we might have while also making sure that we are kicking those doors open to make sure that other people are, are welcome to come into them with us. Um, so with, I think of political social work within these five domains uh, that Suzanne and I have discussed at great, great, great length. Um, so in, engaging individuals and communities in political processes. So this includes things like getting people registered to vote and getting people, making sure people feel like their voices are heard. Um, but it also includes things like influencing the policy agendas of policymakers. So not just going into a room where somebody else has set the stage, but also helping to set the stage for what, what topics are going to be on the table. 
um, holding professional and political positions, working for elected officials, um, you know, working within um, within government areas that involve political social work, engaging with electoral campaigns, and uh, seeking and holding elected office. And I think sometimes, especially when people hear that I, I train people to run for office, they'll say, well, I don't ever want to run for office. And my response to that is always, that is fine. You don't ever have to run for office, but that doesn't mean you're off the hook. That doesn't mean that there aren't ways that you can engage with the process. Um, and I will tell you, as somebody who ran for office, um, and I ran for Board of Education in my town in this last election. Um, I really enjoyed a lot of the experience. I didn't enjoy all of it. I lost by 47 votes. That part of it I didn't enjoy all that much. Um, but I do think there's a lot about the, the process of running for office that's helpful for us, but there are so, so, so many other ways that social workers can be involved. So even if you never wanna see your name on the ballot, that's okay, you, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and I also wanted to highlight that on the right hand side here, you see Gita McClendon and Ali Lozano and Suzanne Pritzker, who have done tremendous work over the last few years around defining and um, and helping us understand what political justice would look like. And I think as social workers, we're used to this idea of social justice and political justice is essentially um, an aspirational idea that we are trying to get to, right? Where all of us have not just equal access to voting, but also equal access to political opportunities to run for office, to have elected officials hear our voices. Um, this is something that is an ideal. It has never existed in the United States. And and we know that political injustice disproportionately harms all the people who are affected by other kinds of systemic oppression, right? People of color, people in poverty, people with, with health challenges or disabilities. Um, and a lot of the work that I'm working on right now has been looking around the ways that the political system and the criminal justice system um, interact and the ways that that specifically um, disproportionately harms people with criminal justice involvement um, and what we as social workers can do that. Um, so I hope that you'll think about ways that you as an individual can in bring political justice into your practice and your and your advocacy, just like you do other forms of, of social justice. So as, as Rick mentioned, the civic volunteerism model is one of the core um, theories within political science that we bring into a lot of this social work research. Um, uh, and and certainly, I would agree that it doesn't really address identity very well and sort of the different ways that we each approach the world. Um, but I also think there's another key element missing from the civic volunteerism model, and that is context, right? Where we are is, is important to the kind of work that we do and how we can get involved. Um, and Luke's, this is also out of political science, but I really like his, his um, conceptualization of the dimensions of power. So what I mean by that is power is, is about a lot of different things, right? So power is about, do I, you know, as, as a professor, do I have the ability to tell you you have to do an assignment, right? So I have power over you. Or one group of people who has the majority of votes in Congress can make another group do what they want to do. Um, but it's also the power to decide what's on the agenda, right? So when I show up at my Board of Education meeting, what are they talking about? Are they talking about social emotional learning? Are they talking about the, you know, the school to prison pipeline? If they're not talking about those, th if they're not on the agenda, we're not going to discuss those things. So that's a really important power. And then also this underlying power that shapes our preferences and our perceptions and we don't even often know what's happening. And I think the conversations lately around social media, um, you know, emphasize this, that so much of our perception of the world happens without us being consciously aware of it. Um, and the, the phenomenal TED talk uh, by Jamanda Adichie around the single story is a great example of this. So sometimes our ideas of who other people are is really about the single story that we've heard about them. And it sort of emphasizes that underlying perception. So if you've never seen this TED talk after the conference today, go watch it immediately. I've got a link to it. Um, I think it's a phenomenal way to, to sort of understand that. And I think it, it leads nicely into this idea of thinking about what is who has power in where we live? What is this context that we're trying to do the work in? And how does that affect our ability to do, to do political work? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we've trained more than 2,300 people through the campaign school. And this map gives you a sense of sort of where we've done that training. Um, and I'm gonna use an example today um, from our article that looks at 
Reno versus Hart Reno, Nevada versus Hartford, Connecticut. So two of the most distant places on this map and two places that have a lot of contextual differences as well. So it's a really helpful examination of that. Um, also, I hope you're very impressed by this map. I will not tell you how long it took me to figure out how to do this, but I am very proud of myself. Um, so when we, we conducted a campaign school in Reno, Nevada and in Hartford, Connecticut in the same year, in the 2016 year, and it gave us an opportunity to look and see what, what were the important differences between the two. Um, if you want to dig into all the statistics, you can read the article. But the big picture is that um, one of the big uh, differences we saw between the two groups was in sort of what, what we're calling the perceived relationship between government and govern, right? So in, you know, although there is always a lot of diversity wherever you are, um, there was more of a uh, general skepticism, although very polite skepticism towards government and towards getting involved in the process in Reno than what we what we typically see in Hartford. Um, and some of that reflects tensions around sort of historic, um, you know, how government has related to certain populations. Um, but I also, you know, we saw a lot of sort of this, you know, talking about people having an idea that they can change the world, but also like sort of this negative idea that government isn't capable of creating positive change was something that came across much more strongly in Reno um, than it did in Hartford. Um, and the other issue, back to resources, which are always going to be important, but looking at systemic uh, resources, right? You've got a population in Connecticut where you've got, um, it's so much easier to get to the polls. Uh, the seat of government is never more than, I mean, the traffic is terrible, but it's never more than a couple hours away from you, wherever you are in the state. And the state legislature is in session for much longer. The state legislature is technically a part-time legislature, but it meets for several months every year. In Nevada, the state legislature meets every other year for a very short amount of time. Um, and then the, the resources that the states have available to them also are very different and come from different places. And that affects sort of the, the ability to do the work. Um, we also, it was really compelling to see that in Connecticut, where we have a network of political social workers built up. Um, I can remember like running into somebody at the state capitol once and them saying like, do all social workers come to the state capitol all the time? And I, to which I said, yes, absolutely. Um, and we have there are seven uh, social workers in the Connecticut state legislature. They provide field placements. There's role models. Um, it's just a different, it's a, it's a pipeline that exists. And building that new pipeline in a new place is challenging and is going to take more time and effort and resources so that students can start to see that same, um, those same examples. And social workers who want to get involved, who are practitioners who want to get involved in, in, uh, in advocacy can see the same thing. Um, and then also this idea of political efficacy. So we looked at it not as positive and negative self-efficacy, but we looked at internal and external efficacy. So do I feel like I have the capacity to make change, but also do I feel like the system has the capacity to change when I try to push it? But here's the interesting thing, which I think is on another slide, but I'll tell you now anyway, is that we didn't find a relationship between efficacy and desire to be engaged. So you would expect to find that people who think the system doesn't care about them are less likely to be engaged. But that wasn't true in our small sample of people. And so I'm very curious to look at that in a larger scale and find out if that just happened to be true of this group or if there's if there's something else about that relationship that's not what we would expect. However, this is also really important, right? There were so many similarities between the two groups. Uh, you know, this was happening in 2016, which at the time was the most contentious election I could remember. We just hadn't gotten to 2020 yet. Um, in both groups, there was a ton of political diversity. Um, you know, yes, we have a sense in our heads of what social workers think politically and who they're likely to be. But in any given place, you have social workers who fit a range of political ideologies and different identities and beliefs. And that was true in both places. And I think was a healthy reminder for us as trainers to make sure that we're talking to everybody in the room and not just the people that we think are in the room. Um, and again, in 2016, no matter where we went that year, we did so many campaign schools that year, um, we saw lots of healthy concern and frustration about how the major political parties were working, whether the electoral process was fair, and about other biases that people saw. And 
And those conversations were bigger and louder than they had been in previous years. And I was really grateful for them because I think it required us to do some soul searching and thinking about um, how we presented the status quo and how we presented the system. Um, but as I said, in our study, regardless of the political efficacy scores, both sets of participants um, were in, intended to engage with political systems. And that was a really good, positive, hopeful outcome, even in 2016. Um, a few things to think about sort of big picture, I think is to be really careful about generalizations. And so I'm gonna use two examples here that are around voting rights, because those are the areas I know. Um, you might expect, right, based on often we think of like states that have good voting laws and states that have bad voting laws or states that we think of as progressive or regressive. Um, but in fact, having lived in both Connecticut and South Dakota, it is so much easier to vote in South Dakota than it is in Connecticut. In South Dakota, they've had early voting forever. My, you know, my dad just wanders in to a voting place whenever he gets around to it on whatever day he wants leading up to election day and votes. And in Connecticut, we don't have early voting. We're actually fighting to change our state constitution so that we can even have a vote on whether we could have early voting. Um, and as you can imagine during COVID that has presented some really challenging difficulties. Um, and so I think it's really important not to just assume the state is good and the state is bad. There was, I, I should have found a picture of it. Uh, one of our local voting rights groups had a um, uh, sort of a campaign they were doing that basically said, don't let Connecticut be like Georgia. And I was furious because you know what? Georgia has had early voting for a long time. What Georgia is, you know, some of the Georgia laws are about narrowing early voting. We don't even have it. Um, you know, there are places in Connecticut that are enforcing a voter ID standard that is not what's in the state law, but it's in being it's in being enforced and people are getting away with it. So I think it's really important not to assume that that you understand a state just because you know something in general about the political ideology of the state. Um, and I think Voting and felony convictions are another really good example. There's so much diversity across this country about when people who've had felony involvement are able to vote and when they aren't. And that is somewhat correlated with political ideology, but it's also just very, very, very different um, throughout the, the country. So I think it's really important to get to know your context really well and be careful not to generalize. Um, and every place that I've been that I've done this work, whether I was in the political party that had the majority or not, it, you know, it comes down to being able to build relationships and figuring out who are the other people that are doing the work that you want to do. Um, and that was key for us in bringing the campaign school to Reno. You know, we needed to find social workers who were in office. We needed, because there aren't a lot of social workers in office, we had to find social work friends in office that we could bring in to the training. We had to get to know the local context to make sure that the training we were giving was, you know, culturally appropriate for what was, what was happening there. Um, and these relationships are key. Um, another example I'll give you is that in some states, right, when you register to vote, if you fill out the voter registration form wrong, it's a it's 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 a significant it 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 can disenfranchise someone and it can be a crime. And so in in Nevada, when we worked with the University of Nevada Reno to help students register voters, we partnered with a local nonprofit that had expertise in voting, and that nonprofit reviewed every single voter registration form before it went in officially to be sure that we weren't um, that we weren't harming people more than we were doing good. Um, and I think those are just a couple of examples of, of some of those relationships that are important. All right, so what are some resources and tools that are available? You've already heard about voting as social work. I will also give a shout out, I think Alberto is on this call, to Vote ER, which is a phenomenal group of healthcare professionals and social workers who are working to make voter registration more accessible to lots and lots of different people. Um, obviously the Humphreys Institute. Um, if you have not yet started reading the Encyclopedia of Macro Social Work, there are some great, there's great information there. Um, I am biased, but I am very partial to everything that Suzanne Pritzker does at the University of Houston, and particularly these, these two of her most recent articles, um, Political Advocacy Without a Choice, looks at the history of uh, African-American social workers and political office that has been really disappeared from the social work textbooks and political justice along with Ali Lozano um, is sort of a call to action for the profession. Um, 
I have a link to the TED Talk uh, as well. And um, my uh, publishers would be mad at me if I didn't mention that um, in addition to the political social work book with Suzanne, I also have a policy textbook that I wrote with Sage. Um, and so, although I am uncomfortable selling my stuff, if you want to know more, here's more information about those. Um, so I think, Rick, you're going to um, moderate the question. So I will stop sharing and, uh, and turn it back over to you. Shannon, thank you so much. I, I, I knew there was a reason I wanted you and me to be in the same session. And I, and I think the overlap around the civic engagement model uh, was what I was, what I was thinking about at the time. So um, there are a lot, there are a number of questions that, that have come in. And um, one of them was, was uh, asking about how to get into the, your campaign school. And I think you, you just uh, explained that, right? So wh what else can you tell us about uh, what people learn at the uh, campaign school and, and why someone may, what, and when are you doing it again? And why not in the South? These kind yeah. of questions are coming up. Yeah, so we have done, um, so we had a campaign school in Tennessee and we actually have one coming up in March in North Carolina. Um, we also though, um, Previously, um, we only offered the campaign schools in person and because of COVID in the last year, we, we offered uh, the campaign school virtually this last year and that was tremendous. It was a daunting experience. I give Tanya and her team full credit for making it actually work. Um, but that is a great opportunity if there's not a big audience of people near you who are interested, then we, we've we had people, we've had people from Germany, we've had people from all from, uh, we've had many people from Texas come up to Connecticut over the years. So that's definitely a way to do it. Um, the campaign school is two days of um, sort of how camp, so, so we talk about how campaigns work, like what do you need to know to work on a campaign or run for office? Like what are all these terms that people use? How do you actually reach out to voters? Um, we spend a ton of time talking about how all these social work skills that you have are actually really applicable in the campaign world. You know, so when I went around and knocked on doors in my town, I, what was I doing? I was engaging with people. I was creating a relationship with them. I was doing lots of active listening. Um, and, you know, figuring out what people needed and trying to meet them where they're at. I mean, it's, there's a ton of micro social work skills that, that get involved. Um, we also talk about how to raise money, which is useful. Whatever kind of social work you do, it's useful to know how to raise money. Um, and we bring in lots of different panels of people to talk about the experiences of um, running for office as, you know, in, in terms of what it's like. Uh, if you are a person of color running for office, if you are a woman running for office, um, just trying to sort of explore all of the different ways that running for office is um, can be can can be different for different people. Um, I'm a little bit biased. I highly recommend it. Um, and I think Jessica just put the link in there, but I'm also going to put my um, uh, my email in and you're welcome to email me with any questions. And if I don't know the answers, then I'll connect you to Tanya Rhodes-Smith at UConn and she will. Probably if people Google campaign school, University of Connecticut, that would work too. Yep, politicalinstitute.ucon.edu. That's too much to Google. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there is a question uh, I think directed at, at me about the connection between social change and political action. And th that's, um, we, we don't have data exactly from our efforts but certainly without political action, there's going to be very little uh, political change. And so I think yeah, the more we can equip people with the tools, including running for office himself or you know, raising money, um, uh, the better it will be. Uh, there, was, there was a comment that kind of flashed by in the, in the chat that was about, well, you know, social work requires, uh, CSWE requires that there's a, education on advocacy, but maybe not actual advocacy practice. Um, and so certainly, just like any other kind of practice, you get better at it, you feel better about it, and you feel more efficacious. So it's, in, in my opinion, there are far too many schools that are calling themselves uh, generalists, or the undergrad program is a generalist program, but they really don't have much in the way of a macro practice or political practice or political social work when there, there's so much material out there that's been put together by people like 
uh, Mimi Abramovitz and Terry Mizrahi and the, the whole macro uh, matters kind of group that's done wonderful work. It's out there. There's no reason for schools not to implement it other than I guess they just don't want to <laughs> or, or they, they're not aware of it. So I think we can all do a better job of spreading the expectation that students will come out not just with book knowledge, but with uh, actual experience, just like they do in other forms of social. Thoughts about CSWE, Shannon? Oh, I have many thoughts about CSWE. <laughs> that, that, uh, you, that you can share? No, I mean, I, I think it is, I mean, I think that the, there, I would agree. So Susanna and I did a survey in 2014 and looked at what field placements were available in the policy and political world. And the one of the biggest things we heard, it's interesting, you heard from students that they don't have time. We heard from faculty that they feel like they don't have time. Um, but we also heard a lot of people say, well, if, I, if I'm asking students to do macro things, then they're not getting the clinical experience that they're going to need, and they're going to have trouble getting licensed. And we heard that, interestingly, at the BSW and the MSW level. And as you said, BSW programs are, by definition, supposed to be generalist, but that definition of generalist, I would agree, seems to be more micro now than, than what, what I think it was originally intended to do. Um, and I do think that, you know, certainly the CSWE competencies include, um, include content around policy practice. Um, but I think as long as the push-pull is really focused in on, um, on licensure and the clinical side of things, it, does, it makes it hard to create space. Um, and I highly recommend for people who are interested in sort of how licensure affects the profession, Linda Plitt Donaldson and Catherine Hill and that group have come up with a, a number of really good articles thinking about how, what licensure means in social work and specifically what it means for macro practitioners. Uh, we, we just got another uh, question in. <laughs> I feel like I'm on the, the talk show host, but this, this is great. I love the questions. Uh, the question is, um, do you have any tips for doing advocacy uh, on the macro level, or mi micro level when your family and friends have drastically different ideologies? I, mean, I think that's something that um, the current pol polarization in, in society has just made it really, really uh, difficult. Uh, Shannon, now that I've introduced a question and giving you a few <laughs> seconds, I'm going to ask you and then I'm going to think about my answer. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, it's a great question. And I think if I had the, if I had the magic key to that, I would, I would have a lot more money than I do now. Um, and I will say, right, like I grew up in, in Western South Dakota. Um, I, you know, I can remember a time when I was working for Tom Daschle, who at the time was the Democratic leader of the United States Senate. And my grandfather was driving around with a dump Daschle bumper sticker on his van, um, and uh, he used to tell people, and I quote, well, at least she has a job. <laughs> um, so first of all, you are not alone. I've been there. Um, I think part of, I guess I would say one of the big challenges is deciding what you want out of the interaction. Is it that the people around you are, um, that they disagree with you? Or is it that they are making statements that suggest that you and who you are are, are not acceptable, right? So, um, you know, for example, how I deal with my family members who have different political ideologies than me is different from a sibling that I have who is queer and feels really strongly that who she is is unacceptable to family. And those are very different situations. And her first priority needs to be taking care of herself. And I will always, always support her in taking care of herself. Um, but I also think, you know, I think I spend a lot of time in these conversations listening. Um, I That is often making my head explode. But I think, um, you know, I've never changed my mind because somebody sat me down and said, you're wrong. And I'm going to tell you all the reasons that you're wrong. Um, so, I mean, I really, I got to go back to those core social work skills, right? Create relationships, engage. And if, if it's, if you, oh, I just saw the question about Kirsten Cinema. Uh, sorry, that just dripped in there. Um, and think about what you want out of it. Is it that you're having a conversation with a family member and it's really important to you that they get vaccinated. Um, and that's the thing that's different. So that's about health and safety of your family and you setting a boundary for your family, right? As opposed to if you're trying to get a family member to vote the way that you want them to, that's a different 
outcome that's a different sort of level of importance to you. And I think you'd approach that in a slightly different way. So that's my very off the cuff response. Rick, do you have something better? Well, I don't know if it's better, but uh, I, I turn to the ideas of motivational interviewing, where you just have to look at the person in front of you and say, well, this person is pre-contemplation. They're not even thinking along the same ways that I am. So what are the ways I can engage with that person in a way that gets them not to change immediately, um, but just to be open to a consideration of a different viewpoint? I think that's the toughest thing that we have going is that people are not listening. Uh, and so Shannon, I, I value your suggestion to sit and listen, even when it makes your, your head explode. So, mm -hmm. But also take care of yourself. And sometimes it's not good for you to listen, in which case you have our permission to stop <laughs> and walk away. As, as if you needed it. But, <laughs> but, um, but I, I think it's, it's really important that uh, the that uh, we have the idea that persuasion is probably going to be more effective than beating someone up. Although in the case of Christian cinema, you know, I, I don't condone violence, but there, that's, that's been a, a real disappointment uh, for me anyway, in terms of, of political, but we, we don't need to get in, into that specifically. Um, I'm thinking that the, uh, but the, the motivational interviewing process is, is another example of where micro social work skills are really uh, helpful in advocacy. I mean, uh, one of the stereotypes that I think some people have about advocacy and political social work is it means uh, making a sign and walking up and down the street and having a big mass protest. Um, I, you know, there's, there's work I've done in the past on interest group strategies. And the interest group leaders that I surveyed didn't think necessarily that mass protests were the most effective way. They thought uh, it, was, it was better to be able to work from the inside. Although, of course, it's helpful to have the outsider pressure, and then it makes whatever you want as an insider seem uh, more reasonable and more likely. But I, I think that we need to keep in mind, just as Shannon was saying about the, our engagement skills, you know, our, our micro skills in terms of uh, persuasion and listening and um, just presenting people with alternatives that, that they may not have, have uh, experienced. People are in their cultures um, and it's hard to, to change that. Uh, which brings up another thought that I had, which is uh, about regional differences. There's a, a theory about uh, regional differences called uh, political culture. And it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, old and it hasn't been updated uh, super well, but it's still useful in understanding policy differences between states that uh, like there's, there's one book I read about the seven different Americas and it kind of grouped them regionally. And so I think you can expect to see different patterns of policy and, and what's effective in terms of advocacy uh, being different in the different regions of the United States. So yeah, and I think actually, Rick, that it's a history of the eleven rival regional cultures of North America, and we use that as the foundation for the, we did to try to have a better way of conceptualizing what's different about Nevada and Connecticut. It was really helpful in that. Oh, good. See, there's a lot of overlap. I'm I'm, I'm a Michigan grad too, although I was at the. Go PhD level and in the joint PhD in political, political science and social work. And I have to say, there's so much valuable information in any political science course on American government, just um, and, and all of these kind of topics that we're talking about. I did want to, in case people didn't see it, there's a couple of great links, uh, links into the Vote ER project in the chat. So I definitely recommend um, taking a look at those. Um, and I will get my list of resources to, to Jessica. Um, I do have a comment about Kirsten Cinema that I don't think will get me in trouble, um, which is also to say that randomly I had lunch with her once, like 20 years ago. Um, and, but I think it's really important that, you know, I think that, and I've been part of a lot of efforts to like change the faces of who gets elected to office, right? Like to make sure that we have, you know, we want to get social workers elected. We want more women in office. We want more people who aren't white in office. We want more LGBTQ folks in office. 
But I also think it's really important to remember that we can't assume what somebody believes or how somebody will vote without actually sitting down and asking them those questions, right? Because somebody is a social worker does not mean that they agree with me on everything, right? And I think that, um, I think this, the, the, what, what's been happening, what, you know, the way that, that Senator Sinema has been voting lately has been an interesting reminder um, that we need to sort of, I think, interrogate better and dig a little bit deeper um, than somebody's, you know, race or gender or job title to be sure that we really understand who they are and, and what they're going to, how they're going to act in office. There's a question here about, um, it would be interesting to know more about the link between political action and social policy change. And I, I think um, I, I was addressing that uh, in terms of saying that we don't, what we, there's been a lot of studies on what is effective, uh, such as the uh, working from the inside as opposed to working from the outside. Um, but sometimes the folks on the inside aren't listening. And so we do need those, those outside protests and marches and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and I guess my bottom line is if we don't do political advocacy, we're not gonna see the kind of change that social workers want, which is why I think it's so important not only to, to know what we believe and to be able to articulate that, but then how do we reach across the gap between our home computer and the, uh, the minds and thoughts of the um, elected officials? And how do we make sure that the people who get elected reflect the social work values that we want to see? Um, and and I, I know that we all have to deal with compromises. And sometimes a person has a strategic reason to vote differently than how we would want them. But it, um, it, it's sort of like, is the person 75% uh, on our side? That's better than someone who's 75% against us. So. Um, I think we have a tendency to want purist and perfectionism, but I, I don't think that that's really going to happen. So I think we have to be willing to play a long game and gradually change things. And, and uh, one of the things that Republicans have done very, very well and, and very conservative people have played the long game and they've been able to take over a lot of local offices now. And like, if you look at school boards, the people who were elected, Shannon, maybe you, you're happy you're not on the school board, but uh, those people went into it with one set of expectations about, well, this will be about education. And it's turned into this massive culture war with uh, people being, uh, getting dressed with death threats and, and other kinds of horrible things. Um, and so, you know, if, if school boards get taken over, if, if, like down the ballot offices, like um, you know, who's running elections in your county get taken over by someone who believes in the big lie, then it's, um, these are important things. And, and we can't afford to ignore local and, and smaller seeming jobs just because they haven't been controversial in the past. Um, I think we're, we're moving into a situation where things can turn ugly very fast. And, and uh, the social change we need is to um, make sure that our voices are heard and that the best way to be heard is to be inside the room and not outside. Well, and I think it's gotta be both, right? Like, I, you yes. know, I spent, you know, the first 10 years of my political career inside the Senate and then I've spent the last however many years outside. And I think it's got, you, you need both, right? And I think this can be as simple as, you know, sometimes, you know, when if your elected official votes the way that you don't like, you call them. If they vote the way you do like, trust me, I've answered those phones, you don't call. So often the people who are trying to, to work the way you want them to, they need the backup from you, right? They need the backup from outside. And I think that can be really important. Um, but I also just want to emphasize the importance of state and local positions and not even just elected officials, right? There's a, a comment from Annabelle in the chat about volunteering with the Human Traffic Committee in Kansas. There's a ton of 
non-elected appointed positions in every state and locality throughout the country that have a real big impact on what happens where you are. Um, like I'm thinking of, so Justin Hodge, who's a, on faculty at the University of Michigan, he is currently, he just got elected to be a county commissioner, but before that he sat on the, the civilian police oversight board for Washtenaw County. And that's not an elected position, he was appointed into it, and it makes a difference who's on the police oversight board, right? That's really important. Um, and so I think figuring out, you know, I mean, there are some committees in my town that like, you know, like the, I don't know, like the cemetery committee, I'm not, that's not my, not gonna be my jam, but like the planning and zoning committee, affordable housing in my region is terrible. I mean, the housing in Connecticut is so unbelievably segregated, which again, keep in mind when you think of, if you think of Connecticut as a progressive state, that we're one of the most segregated states in the country. And the way to get more, to change that and to, to create more mixed use housing is to get people on the planning and zoning committee who are going to vote for um, for a more a different way of looking at housing rather than, um, you know, we can't have anything in our community that will change the character of the town, which is completely code for keeping it as white as possible. And so I, those local things, they don't require you to like, you know, quit your job and get a new whatever. Um, and they can be, I saw JT's question about how do you locate one? So, so in my town, I can go to the town website. It has a list of all the town boards that are elected and everything in the town. And my town is 5,500 people. If we have a website that does this decent chance that your town does, um, in some places you need to get put onto those committees through your local um, political bodies. So, so my town, you might be the Republican town committee or the Democratic town committee nominate people for those committees. In other towns, they're just so excited to have people volunteering that if you call the town and say like, I'm new here, I wanna get involved, they'll be really glad to hear from you. Um, I got involved in my town politics because when I registered to vote, there was a little check mark on the thing that said check off if you're willing to volunteer on election day. And I checked that out and they called me immediately. And my, the first election I worked was the 2016 election. And um, now I'm the deputy registrar of voters in my town. So there's there's a, a, a lot of work to be done. And in most towns, there's not enough people willing to do it. And there'll be most places are going to be really excited to have you. Let me back that up, uh, Shannon, with an example. I, I teach a course on advocacy, which um, uses my book called Advocacy Practice for Social Justice, well, available on Amazon. And um, that um, uh, th there was a student in, in that class, and one of the, the assignments was to speak to a, a, a local politician. And they had such a good conversation that within about two or three weeks, that student was asked to be on a commission uh, for the entire city of Fort Worth, which is one of the top 50 largest cities in the country. And really all it took was making a contact, having a little bit of a relationship. And um, it, it, it's a lot easier than you might think. And it, even in my town, uh, which is 50,000 people uh, in the vast Dallas Fort Worth area, they send out notifications of if you want to serve, here's a, you can be on this commission or that commission. It's really a way to develop your own relationships uh, and your own um, ability to kind of move up the food chain of the political system. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a story that uh, was told by Ann Richards, who was the last Democrat governor in Texas and just a, a real hoot of a person and very, very progressive, and, and her daughter was the head of Planned Parenthood for a while. But uh, she, she uh, Ann Richards' uh, husband was, was very active in democratic politics. And one day the local county folks came over and said, hey, uh, Dave, uh, we want you to run for state senator. And he said, I, I couldn't possibly do that. I'm, I'm too busy, blah, blah, blah. And so then everyone kind of looked around and wondered who could do it. And Ann Richards had been the behind the scenes person for decades and no one was asking her. So finally her husband said, hey, Ann, why don't you do it? And so, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, and she said, sure, I'll do it. Uh, sometimes you just have to kind of put yourself out there um, because the, the usual channels aren't looking at you and, and you need to, be willing to say yes and, and even put yourself out there and say, well, I'll do it. Anyway, that's my story about Ann Richards. Uh, Shannon, I think we have one more question for you now. Okay. Um, 
you know, when the campaign school, you know, it, it seems like a great idea, but because elections are different across the country and the regional differences in what's going to get you elected and what's going to get you pilloried, you know, how, how do you take into account all of those regional differences in your training and your advice that you give to people? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. And I, somebody had asked, you know, earlier why we aren't in the South more. Um, and um, one of the things that we really try hard to do is to partner with either NISW chapters or schools of social work. Um, and so if you're in the South and you want to do some campaign school stuff, let us know. Um, but it is a challenge, right? And I think there's two there's two answers to that one is that we bring in as many local people we pack the trainings with as many local people as we can find who can talk about what that specific context is like um and so you know in 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 reno we had a social worker who sits on the uh the school board um and you know we've had you know state senators and sort of local polit like unelected like political activists all sorts of people but the other thing is that like there is a fundamental of like campaigns are campaigns no matter where you go. Um, and so like, you know, I've knocked on doors in South Dakota and Louisiana and, you know, New York and Connecticut. And it's the same thing, right? You're doing the same thing no matter what. And so what we try to focus on in the campaign school is what are the things that are commonalities and what are the things that that you're going to need to know, the terminology you'll need to know. Um, asking for money is the same no matter where you go. The rules about how much money you can ask for is different, but the actual prospect of, of asking for money is about like, you know, hey, Rick, I'm running for school board. Would you be willing to donate $100 to my campaign? And then shutting up before I talk you out of donating $100 to my campaign. Um, that's the same no matter where we are. And so we try to focus on those things that are, that are sort of going to help you no matter where you are. But we also we try to make sure people know that when they leave, they've got to make those relationships and get connected to people um, and get to know their, their local context as well as they possibly can. Um, and for the record, that Ann Richards story is really common. I have a, a good friend who's in the state legislature here and she got her first job in politics because they asked her then boyfriend at the time to do it. And he was like, why are you talking to me? Why are you not talking to her? Um, and I think that's, there's something really important, right? You know, that's that's what being an ally is right being like well i don't know why you're talking to me but this person over here who's from the community is a much better person in this job go ask them right that's that's a really easy bit of allyship that i think uh, a lot of social workers can do yeah. and and that was the point i was going to make also is that nasw texas uh, or nasw in every state has got a lot of great resources and people and they are always needing people to volunteer. So if you don't want to go into polit political social work from a kind of a partisan way, uh, you, you maybe get into the local uh, PAC, which in Texas is called T-PACE. Um, and, uh, and they will probably be willing to appoint you uh, very quickly. Um, I was president of, of the uh, T-PACE for a couple of uh, terms. Uh, it was fascinating. And one of the best parts about it is you get to give money away. Now, you don't get to give a lot of money away, but, but uh, NASW, each state has some funding when you uh, endorse a candidate. Um, and speaking of laws about you have to know about, I work at, at a state university and I, I could not transact giving money away to a candidate on state property. So we had to go across the street to McDonald's and then I gave him the, the, the check. So. Um, that's the kind of stuff you have to be careful of. So um, it's, it's important to have the um, support and knowledge of an organization like NASW in whatever state you're in. So I, there was a question for me about, do I think that my results will generalize to other states? And I think that's the, the very cool thing about the civic engagement model or the volunteerism model is it's been shown to be true in many, many studies in different areas. And and also internationally. This is a, a model that is ripe for use. And uh, I think we can improve it as Shannon and I have talked about in terms of adding some of the more identity characteristics, um, because we know that all systems don't work the same for everyone. And what I can do as a, a 
more senior white male is uh, different than what many people uh, can be expected to be able to do. So, um, Shannon, before we run out of time, do you have any final thoughts uh, as we close out this session? Uh, well, I do, I do want to say that, yeah, I think one of the things that we do know is that um, just doing the political action is so key to feeling more confident and building your efficacy at doing it, doing it more. Um, I hope he doesn't mind that I'm going to pick on him, but Francis Fermanac is on this call and um, he's a PhD student at Sacred Heart. And I have a great picture of Francis that I should have put in my presentation. Um, registering voters, um, I believe he was registering a turkey. I'm not real clear why the person was dressed as a turkey. Um, and, you know, Francis started in class registering voters because that was part of a, a, one of his options to do in class and ended up um, being an elections administrator in his town. And he's now done that for a couple of different elections. And I think that's the kind of thing that wherever you are, um, however scary it is finding the thing that you can do that isn't that is available to you, that works with the time you have, that is maybe just a one-time commitment or a short thing. Um, it's really just the first step that is the hardest, just like everything else that we do as social workers. And so, um, you know, for those of you who already have been involved, you know, I got a message from somebody who worked on Justin Hodges' campaign. That's wonderful. Keep doing it. Now, now go do the next thing. And for those of you who haven't yet, um, I promise you, I can't even, I cannot even tell you how much I dislike talking with other human beings. It is not my thing. I do not enjoy it. And I went and knocked on doors. So I promise you, if I can do it, it's, it, it is not nearly as scary as you think it is. And just to follow up on that and, and to, to give a, a strong sense of support is um, local elections are coming up many places around the country. And um, you know, certainly in the spring, at least in Texas, is when we tend to have them. But uh, they're so easy to get involved. Um, you can even probably do it from home. Uh, you, uh, they have envelopes that need stuffing, uh, all the way up to knocking on doors. I mean, there's there's such a wide variety of things that you can get started with, and to get yourself just off of, uh, you know, we've all been in a pandemic. Uh, induced haze, or at least I'll, I'll say I have. And uh, it's great to be able to get outside in most places, be safe, and, and be able to, to have that contact and, and to feel like you're making a difference because of your life and your actions. So that's what Speak is about. And I know that's what the Campaign School is about. That's what uh, Shannon's research is about in her writing. And I, I want to say also, to those of you who are academics out there and you have your own schools, uh, we would love to be able to uh, help you create your own speak in your, um, at your university. <laughs> we don't have the funds to do that. <laughs> you're gonna have to find that yourself, but we can uh, try to help with our connections. And certainly we're pioneering a way to integrate uh, speak into uh, the college uh, and the university at the University of Texas at Arlington. And so far, it's going really well. And uh, every month or two, I'm going to be like sharing the good news with people on the Speak website and through Speak emails, which you can sign up for. <laughs> and uh, here we're, we're, we're devolving into the sales pitch, but um, there, there's so much that you can do um, and the resources are available for you. So thank you very much. I really love talking with you, Shannon, and hearing your thoughts. And hearing the, the answers to your questions. And I hope everyone comes back in uh, about half an hour. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me, Rick. Oh, it's fun. So glad. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.